Welcome to the Fondazione Gaudi. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it is a great pleasure today to welcome our guests, uh, and in particular, Professor Venda, uh, whose book we are launching today here in Turin, uh, Professor Eduardo Cottarolo, Professor Irene Gatto, and joining us online, Professor Mark Field. Um, so it's, it's a great honor, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I feel I have a great responsibility, not just because Maurizio uh, was my PhD supervisor, but also because this is one of the first book symposium on uh, Southern Europe in the Age of Revolution, uh, Maurizio's latest book published by Princeton University Press. Um, and in uh, today's book launch, we have uh, three speakers that will comment on the book. Uh, after Maurizio's introduction and Maurizio's presentation of his work. Um, each speaker will have 15 minutes to uh, offer comments uh, and insights on these uh, volumes, and then we'll open the Q&A. Um, everyone will be, uh, very, will be very welcome to join the conversation, and we'll have a second round of, of uh, debate of questions. Um, before introducing Maurizio, let me thank in particular the Fondazione Inaudi for hosting this event in collaboration with the Turin Humanities Program, uh, whose fellows and early career researchers are here, and the Fondazione 1563, uh, based in Turin too. And this event is also all here in partnership with two departments of the University of Turin, um, the department, department of Culture, Politics and Society and the Department of History, whose uh, researchers and scholars are here joining us today. Um, so, it's a great pleasure to welcome Maurizio de Fondazione in Audi. Maurizio used to be a fellow to the Fondazione years ago, um, and the Fondazione supported the beginning of his uh, studies. This is not Maurizio's first book. Um, he already published uh, a volume in 2009, published with Oxford University Press, uh, Judgment in Exile, on the Italian diaspora and the Italian intellectual thinkers, revolutionaries that went abroad during the age of the Risorgimento and that reflected on the ideas of Italy and unification from abroad. Uh, then Maurizio co edited with Costantina Zanu uh, a book on Mediterranean ideas in the 19th century, on the circulation, transnational circulation of ideas, political actors in the 19th century, exploring alternative currents of liberalism, cosmopolitan thought in the Mediterranean. Um, Maurizio is full professor of modern history at Queen Mary University of London. He has held fellowships and visiting uh, professorship across several institutions in Europe and in the US, such as Cambridge, Birkbeck, Princeton, Harvard, Lisbon, Madrid, the European University Institute, and, and Erfurt. Uh, and it's a great pleasure today to welcome him to um, present uh, his book. Um, so please, Maurizio, the floor is, is yours. Yes. Giuseppe, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me, Mark? Okay. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And thank you very much to the Fondazione Emilia 563 for supporting this event, as well as to the uh, program, the doctoral program of the University of Turin and, and uh, one of its um, um, organizers, Barbara Curli, and all the PhD students present here, as well as the fellows of the Fondazione Inaudi. As Giuseppe said, I, I certainly have, for me, it is a really moving occasion to be here today, because my presence here coincides with the 30th anniversary of me becoming a fellow of the Fondazione Inaudi um, when I had just uh, graduated from the University of Milan, and this Borsa di Studio enabled me to go to England to study Italian exiles abroad, and if I'm a historian today, I have an immense debt of gratitude to the Fondazione Einaudi. Thank you again um, to the Fondazione. I will very, very briefly sketch out what are the aims of my project so that people get a bit of background about this book and, and um, the comments of the discussants be, will become more intelligible, um, not because they are not, but just because you will not have read the book. So, what does the Age of Revolutions look like from the southern peripheries of Europe? My book attempts to answer this question by looking at a set of simultaneous revolutions that broke out between 1820 and 21, 
in Portugal, Spain, Piedmont, um, Naples, Sicily, and Greece. And it does uh, in the 1820s, so it does so uh, within a larger chronological span uh, from the Napoleonic Wars into the 1860s. So it covers um, a broad geography of a variety of empires, um, polities, but it is not organized uh, on a country by country basis. It is actually organized thematically and comparatively by combining a variety of spatial unities. So I analyze these revolutions in an Ibero-American global context, um, in the framework of the southern European space, uh, imperial, national, regional, local, as well as urban spaces down to the level of squares. Uh, <clears throat> although it is organized comparatively, the book um, deals with one key overarching question. What is a constitution? What was the constitution for the actors um, of these revolutions? Uh, these were revolutions that were introduced in monarchies to, uh, to <coughs> constitutionalize monarchies. They were not revolutions that aimed at introduce, uh, introducing republican uh, government. So in order to answer this question, it soon became clear to me that a variety of methodological approaches were needed. And to begin with, I had to look at a variety of different texts. From the public manifestos produced by the military officers who declared these revolutions, because these revolutions were all military pronunciamentos, revolutions organized by army officers, um, supported by their regiments and a substantial section of their armies. Um, political catechisms, newspapers, pastoral letters by bishops, uh, sermons um, written and delivered by constitutional priests, petitions submitted to parliaments and monarchs by local communities and professional corporations, but also poetry, songs, satirical texts, and pasquinades. And I analyze this text in relationship to a set of political practices, uh, elections, the military pronunciamentos, uh, public ceremonies, protests, uh, and also I, um, I look at the social context and the social actors uh, behind these practices who, um, the, who are both the audiences and producers of these texts. Um, it is also a, a history uh, uh, of connections, so I look at the connections uh, between these revolutions um, the people who move across uh, these countries, but also the texts and the documents and the practices that uh, move between Portugal and Greece. So what is the overarching argument, if that is possible, to say of the book? What are the key features of the constitutional culture of the 1820s? It is a constitutional culture that uh, seeks to basically renegotiate the relationship between the people and the monarchs on the basis of the argument that after the Napoleonic Wars, when the people of Southern Europe shed their blood to defend the power of the monarchs against Napoleon, the monarchs now had to acknowledge this sacrifice and, and be given um, a share of the sovereignty of their states. It is a constitutional culture that recognizes a, a number of individual rights that did not exist before, but uh, it is, has also very strong communitarian overtones, to begin with because uh, the framework for these um, uh, rights were uh, communities, the nations that were underpinned by um, uh, notions of religious uniformity that uh, limited, uh, for instance, freedom of expression or freedom of um, religion. It is a political culture, a constitutional culture, that combines the idea of freedom as the freedom of the individual with freedom as privilege, as freedom of corporations, of, community, of corporations of artisans, or tradesmen, or sailors, freedom from competition, for instance, um, or also with individual freedoms, but also freedoms of territories, freedoms of provinces, freedoms of uh, local communities, villages who wanted 
um, their common lands uh, to be protected against the privatization. It is therefore a kind of hybrid political uh, culture in its understanding of what the Constitution stood for. And therefore, it was also a political culture that uh, opened up a debate and had conflicting interpretation of what the Constitution meant. It was a contested constitutional culture because it was also a constitutional culture that was resisted by an equally powerful uh, popular royalism, a movement in defense of the absolute power of the monarchs underpinned by popular support reflected in a rich, sophisticated popular culture that was as rich as the constitutional um, one. Um, it was a constitutional culture that uh, uh, integrated uh, pre-existing um, early modern uh, brands of cultural protest, ideas of justice, of moral economy, of retribution, of just monarchical power with the new language of 19th century constitutionalism. And it was a constitutionalist that had long-term legacies across southern Europe up to the 1860s. It opened uh, up a period of intense instability that invites us to rethink the age of revolution with a different chronology from the Franco-centric one. And I leave it there, I think, because I, um, I like to my discussions to have more time. But thank you for listening to me. Now I'll leave the floor to Professor Macfield for his uh, comments on Maurizio's book. Um, professor Macfield is a professor of history at Warwick, where he is directing the history for the European history, the Cent Research Center for European History. And Macfield interests uh, cover the history of political thought, the history of social and cultural history, political theory, political sociology, in between the 1715 and the 1815. Um, he's worked on the reimagining of democracy between these two centuries, on concepts and ideas of political corruption, and he has published extensively on Thomas Paine, William Godwin, whose diary he um, uh, edited, uh, and in, on Britain in the age of the French Revolution. His latest volume um, is titled Radical Conduct, Politics, Sociability and Equality in London, 1789-1815, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, thank you, Professor Mark Philp, for being uh, with us today, and please, the, the floor is yours. And Mark, I don't know if you could hear Giuseppe. Giuseppe introduced you, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First, I'd like to emphasize what an achievement I think this book is. It's a work of substantive original research across four major countries and the international arena. It brings together scholarships from different countries that rarely speak to each other and are often conducted in relative ignorance uh, of the comparative dimension uh, and significance of the things they study. And it forges a synthetic understanding of the dynamics of politics and revolution in the region that will shift the focus of Anglo-American research in the period more away from Northern Europe and the North Atlantic to the Mediterranean. I mean, that's no mean achievement. My remarks here are going to be quizzical because I always want to know more. And while the book is long, it's probably not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I have three central questions, which I hope are actually might find productive. Not so much because he should have dealt with them in the book, so much as now we know all this, might we, what might we also think about? Um, and then I have a more autobiographical question uh, for him about the writing of the book. So the first of the three questions concerns the pronuncia mento. I think the reason this interests me is that what marks the southern European experience off from the protest movements of the United Kingdom and the revolution in France is how central the army is right from the beginning. The book is very clear on how important the military are in these revolutions 
and the, to the form that those revolutions take. So the pronunciamento is a form of throwing down the gauntlet to issuing a challenge, almost in a duel, making a statement that calls on others to recognize your claim on their attention and inviting others to join you and declaring what's wrong with the established order and what it has to address. It interests me especially because it's not a challenge to monarchy, as Maurizio makes clear. It characteristically challenges the despot in the name of the king. So we might ask, does the pronunciamento have a civil form? But I think that's a badly posed question, even if it is mine. It seems to be a military activity that is expressed in a particular civic language uh, and a set of demands. At its heart is this challenge. I see that challenge as masculine, made in the name of one's honour, and as a performative invocation of the manly virtues of the aspired to citizen, by which yeah, one aims to serve one's country. So the military and the civil are really locked and yoked together. I think this might be a very old practice, and Marito clearly didn't have time to go into the origins of it. I, I would have told him before if I'd known about it, but I very recently came across an example um, in Switzerland in the 16th century of a pattern of collective action against unfaithful leaders that was developed in the Grisson, uh, one of the sections of um, what subsequently became Switzerland. Historians refer to them as the Stadtgericht, um, which is a penal court that drew judges from every commune to try and punish those seen as acting against the free state. But that formal court was only the last stage of a quite complex process that started with a banner raising. In Rhaetian Germany, it was known as the Farn Lil Hoof. Um, a number of districts would gather together, raise their banners in a central spot, and if successful, they would bring nearly all the communes together to an assembly. The subsequent assembly stage formulated the complaints the third tried the conference, but the banner raising looks very much like the pronunciamento <coughs> of the, the common good, or against the violation of pacts that bound the communes together. So you might think, well, Switzerland is a bit off-centre here, hardly southern Europe, what's he talking about as well? Well, um, at the time, the Grisons were being pressured by France and by Spain for access to trade and for routes for military supplies and recruits through their land. And many of the banner raisings that took place were part of a program of resistance to Spanish and French and also Venetian influence in the district. And like pronunciamentos, the Barnier Route was not just about local issues, it was an appeal on the basis of national policies which were seen as departing from the agreed basis for their association. Now I raise this, this as an example, perhaps just to underline how old some of these processes are, but also to suggest that patterns of protest with a degree of normative weight, that have a logic and an order to them that enable relatively peaceful forms of challenge to public authorities, might be crossing Europe already in the 16th kind of century. What marked the pronunciamento out more starkly, I think, in the 1820s is that it lays claim to an essentially conservative project to conserve the order that it uh, establishes, uh, or that it says uh, is fundamental to the regime in question. It's more like a revolution in the old sense of a restoration of the basic principles and the military component in many cases looks like a way of conferring authority on it. Interestingly, in the Grisson, the civilians were of course all in the militia. 
There's no real boundary between that civic and military kind of dimension. Uh, and probably there wasn't in many Italian city-states where similar practices might be found. But I think it then raises questions about how far the Spanish and Portuguese examples draw on military and civil traditions of a similar type, and what that says for our understanding of the nature of the military under the monarchical and imperial forms of rule that existed in Spain, uh, and to some extent Italy, but also uh, Portugal. That was the first practice that I was interested in looking at. The second concerns petitioning. Maurizio shows this is hardly a new practice, and it's familiar enough from ancien regime societies as a means of communicating concerns and grievances from different areas of the polity to the king, asking him to settle conflicts, his, uh, complaining of his representative's conduct, or drawing his attention to problems that the community faced. As Maurizio shows, petitions in the Ancien Regime were mostly private. Uh, in the UK, some were, but not all. And the UK also has this kind of numbers dimension that emerges in the 18th century, where uh, there becomes an issue about uh, whether you aim to produce them, the, a petition by the most elite members of society, or whether you are trying to get large numbers of people subscribing to a kind of particular petition. In Southern Europe, the move to public petitions seems to be a function of the Napoleonic era, especially in, uh, in those petitions of support for his uh, chosen rulers in parts of Southern Europe. But by the 1820s, petitioning is rooted in the constitutions and practices of the Southern states. And there are also parallels to whom the petitions were addressed. You know, in England, it shifts gradually from the king to parliament. Uh, and I wonder whether there's something similar in that, uh, in, the, in this kind of region. What's clear from Maurizio's account is that petitioning becomes a form of popular action to defend the existing institutions, and in many cases, the constitution of the state. They express the will of the people, and they underline their commitment to the constitution. As Maurizio points out, an active, engaged, and petitioning populace was in fact a mixed blessing for most regimes. And most revolutionaries also tried to put limits on the practice in the name of normal politics, due process, established practice, as against the potentially unruly displays of popular initiative. At the same time, the petition, not unlike the pronunciamento, enabled and aspired to something like an enlarged domain of public participation, as Maurizio argues. It's less the instrumentality of the petitioning that's important, and more their expression as a vehicle for claims that are simultaneously claims about things and claims to participation in the implementation and interpretation of the new order. Moreover, this also indicates that in taking up a form that is es essentially derives from practices of supplication and deference to monarchical power, what we get is a transformation in its performative power and significance, and indeed, in its danger. So, the third area I wanted to raise concerns women. Maurizio's book, Southern Europe in the Age of Revolutions, is not devoid of women. They appear en masse in Catania in support of the Constitution. There are Greek women fighters. There is petitioning by women in Spain. There's a catechism addressing the education of women in Spain in 1822. Women seem to have attended some patriotic societies in Spain and Portugal. Women made cockades and banners. They used fans decorated with images of revolutionaries, and they decorated their mantillas with patriotic colors. They sang songs, and they danced in the festivities of the revolutionary culture. And the market women of Madrid became a key component in royalist public opinion in the reaction. Where the, resource, where the sources tell us, Maurizio tells us. 
which is about all that a historian can be expected to do. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I was struck very recently watching a documentary series in the, uh, in the UK called Once Upon a Time in Northern Ireland about the troubles in the 1970s and 80s. I was struck by how many of the people they spoke to were women. Um, many, but not all, were widows. You can see why activists might be reticent, but it was also testimony to the fact that the vast majority of lives lost were male. And if female, they were people caught in the crossfire or by bombs, uh, that were indiscriminate, or they were being punished directly for their religion, or cross-confessional marriage, or for helping the British. One thing it underlined for me was how much of the languages and practices of revolution in the 1820s centers around men, as they do in a great many other struggles uh, and across a range of kind of periods. And the integral connection with the military with military activity essentially reinforces that. But it then raises questions for me about how far the conventions, practices, and customs of the household in relation to women in this region, in this period, are such as to compromise the idea of a public sphere. By underlining how masculinist and performative it is, dominated by a culture of machismo, embellished but not fundamentally changed by the small contribution of women, and inclusive strictly on its own terms. Now, it's difficult to know how to construct a counter-narrative when evidence is so sparse. But I wonder whether practices of mourning and remembrance might be one way. Traditions of song associated with death and loss, performance of mourning in dress, how children were educated, probably differentially, in their family histories, and wider, wider memorialization practices, both public and private. Now, I do not wish such a task on Maurizio. <laughs> He'll be, be relieved to know it. But in the focus on the revolutions, we do get a history that's predicated on a very masculine version of the public and the private, in which the domestic and household order is largely silent, and in which women appear, appear in men's stories, but rarely in their own. My sense is that trying to say something about women's experience in this period in this region demands a very wide collaborative project the sources are so fragmentary. But I think Maurizio has persuaded me that to appreciate the exact nature of the apparently inclusive and egalitarian dimensions of the revolutionary period, we do also need to think about how resolutely masculinist it is. So my final question is this, and it's more an autobiographical question than a substantive one. <coughs> and it's about the experience of writing the book in reading it, I wondered about Greece and how far it really fits. Of course, it attracts lots of Europeans. It becomes a major site of European intervention. But I wondered if Maurizio had ever regretted its inclusion. Portugal, Spain, Italy are Catholic. They have long-standing connections. Their cultures are deeply entwined. France provides a common and differentially interpreted reference point. And it's not difficult to see them as providing for each other a common frame of reference. And they share rules of engagement, military codes of honor, conceptions of loyalty, duty, and a sense of law in its adjudication. The Greek Revolution uh, was a war of cultural, religious, and political emancipation. <coughs> was, at times, savage, even barbaric on both sides. I won't go on. But I wondered whether he'd ever got to the point, despite having spent the time learning the language, of wondering 
whether it was not the same, that it might have been triggered by similar events, that it's an upheaval of an entirely other sort. So, questions, questions, questions. I think that's because even after more than 600 pages, Maurizio keeps at least this reader wanting more. Many thanks to, to Mark. Mark, can you confirm that you can hear me? You, you don't see, but you should hear me. Is that right? No. Sorry, we have said that you've got to sit in front. Okay, because the my speaker will have to sit in front of Mark, otherwise Mark will not be yeah, yeah. uh, Hello again, Mark. Sorry, I, I thought you were, um, you could hear the, the introduction that I was giving before. Sorry. So, uh, many... Not much. <laughs> Sorry. Many thanks for your comments. I think you touched upon several topics, uh, the army, the support for the constitutional monarchy, the petitions, the, the role of women that will um, be discussed again during the, the, the Q&A and the second round is very relevant to, to the overall framework of the book. Uh, now we'll have the um, comments by uh, Irene Gatto. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Irene is a researcher at the University of Piemonte Orientale, where she also earned her PhD. And there she teaches early modern history. Uh, Irene Gattor's interests cover popular religion and ecclesiastical censorship, European expansion in India and China, with a particular focus on the role of missionaries, and the history of tourism in the early modern modern era, um, secularization, uh, and the relations between politics and religion. And in particular, on these topics, she edited a volume with Eduardo Bottarolo on uh, sec secularization and modernity, um, an historical framework in 2017. Uh, please, Irene, the floor is yours. On the other hand, national spaces 
and uh, indiv individual lives as well are not forgotten in their specificities, but function as mirrors reflecting in each other. Such view traces a new spatiality, an expanded and connected political geography crossed by international routes and flows of people, languages, practices, news, concepts, projects. In this wide and fluid space, Maurizio follows the tracks and effects that connections add in terms of identities, loyalties, political practices, <coughs> and conflicts. In an age in which Napoleonic uh, fractures and instabilities only precariously healed after Bonaparte's defeat exploded. Indeed, the Vienna system generated a widespread crisis of consensus against the restored monarch monarchical regime, a crisis that, that paved the way to the age of revolutions, which, as Maurizio's account points out, was also an age of counter revolutions and civil wars of increasing mobilization of uh, an age of multiplying channels of elaboration and dissemination of political cultures, of ideas, languages, practices. The result of this entangled and dense analysis is a different portrait of the 1820s in Southern Europe. No, not, I quote, the most boring decade of the 19th century. Uh, but a lively and dynamic age when new and unprecedented spaces for discussion and thinking <coughs> about politics were open. For example, the vitality and complexity of the history of the age of revolutions and seen from uh, Southern Europe emerged from the range of ways and channels by which politics uh, circulated and penetrated the everyday everyday life, according to what Maurizio calls, Maurizio calls an quote, unprecedented broadening of the, of, the, of the public space devoted to discussion of politics, which are, which are treated in the part three of the book. This section discusses issues concerning the motive of, uh, for politi political action and the various channels of politicization, the different types of sociability, formal and informal, taking shape in different countries since 1820s. Again, the scope of observation is wide. What is remarkable is a broad conceptualization of political space that includes the uses and appropriation of it outside the sphere more directly related to, to its institution and organization. There is just the idea of an extended sphere of uh, the circulation of politics, of its levels of mediation, of the practices of communication and reception by different, different publics and individuals of the forms of identification, of the effects on, the, on language and political practices, all of which contribute to the construction of the 19th century public sphere. In this regard, I would like to emphasize the issue of reception of political messages and content, which is not understood in the volume as a passive moment an inactive terminal or end-of-the-line point for content, contents from elsewhere. But it is a pre creative moment in which the population also reacts and contributes uh, with appropriations and contaminations in, in, independently of organized campaigns of information or misinformation, uh, as you show uh, in the book. Uh, and in, in this uh, frame, uh, different people, places, and events uh, speak politics, uh, or speak political. Leaders of the constitutional groups, official and soldiers uh, of the military corps, members of the higher clergy, 
workers and artisans, sailors, students, men and women as we are. Even the cities with the, their streets and squares, their toponymy, buildings and statues, banquets, festivities, funerals, a variety of people and situations speak political. I would like to add to this uh, list uh, images uh, and objects as well, which are the focus of recent studies on the relationship uh, between material culture and political cultures. A case in point, uh, just to mention a recent collection of essays, uh, is the volume titled Political Objects in the Age of Revolutions, Material Culture, National Identities, Political Practices, edited by Enrico Francia and Carlotta Sorba, published by Biella 2021-2021. Whose contributions show, mainly by Italian case studies, but also from France, Britain, Spain, how the creation and circulation of things, of objects, contributed to the construction of political languages and practices which traveled beyond national borders and connected different contexts. If the practice of singing was adopted in public to define political identity and challenge political enemies, as chapter, chapter 10 of Maurizio's book argues, also holding ribbons or wearing clothes could have political meaning. And I mention here just one episode, the one occurred in Turin, the evening of January 11, 1821, when four students were arrested at the Vengen Theatre uh, because they were wearing the red and black uh, cap, the colors of Carbonari. A juvenile bravado, maybe more a joke than a conscious political statement. Whatever, whatever it was, the gesture led to the harsh intervention of armed forces and the arrest of the young men, who by the way were all from places in the province of Virginia. <laughs> My place. <laughs> Provoking upheaval and protests among the students of the University of Turing. Mine are just small and partial reflections. What I meant to emphasize is the extent of Maurizio's research, the light it sheds on the landscape of studies of 19th century history, the interest it also shows on aspects of popular political cultures. Through the, their oral reading, uh, con consuming dynamics, their performative dimensions, including forms of power contestation and political iconoclasm uh, that aim to transform visual and material, material landscapes. These are, of course, only some aspects of, of the work. The, one, the ones I mentioned are just some of the many that Maurizio offers us by following the forms, channels, and effects of the circulation, which is, which is also a, a circularity movement of political cultures between educated and uneducated classes, upper and lower strata to society. Elements that illuminate the ways of construction of the public sphere and processes of politicization of society, of the complex and multiple modes and practices of political mobilization from the pivotal decade of the 1820s and along their multiple variations and trajectories over the long 19th century. 19th century. I would uh, like to stop with a question. We have a question regards uh, the issue of religion. In the fourth part of your book, you analyze the relationship between constitutional culture and religion. 
support uh, or non-support of clergy, I don't know, to the constitutional code, the role of priests among the population, especially in the countryside, but not only. Apart from the case of priests, which, which on the religi religious side is quite different, but maybe if you want to spend some few words later on that. The appeal to, uh, to religion by constitutional movements in Catholic countries seem to be above all, or above all instrumental to their case, to their cause. I mean, gaining the support of the church was a means of getting credibility and legitimizing their political vision, and also securing a, a presence on the ground among the local population, of course. Besides, um, well, a negative, a critical views, uh, critical views emerge, for example, on popular forms of uh, devotion or and worships, which are considered irrational, almost uh, superstitious. <coughs> Besides those aspects uh, regarding the more specific issue, issue of the separalization of politics of the nation with the elaboration of civil cults, that of the patriarch, for instance, uh, of its heroes, of its martyrs, uh, which, who are secular heroes and martyrs, that is, they are not religious. What is the kind of dynamic you have identified? I mean, can you say something about the relationship between the sacred and the politics? How it changes, if it changes, uh, over the early 20s? In other words, uh, um, set, set something simplistically. In the period you are dealing with, is there a tension, a tendency, not yet fulfilled, of course, uh, towards an, an autonomous control of the separate by politics, independent of the function of religious, of the religion, the meaning of the separate. Controlled by the politics. Yes. Uh, I mean, independent from religion, from uh, religious institutions, uh, and the role of mediation and legitimization typical in pre-modern societies. And I stop here. Context covering sources that uh, range from uh, not just high, high theory political texts, but covering uh, pamphlets, essays, journals, reviews, and catechisms. Um, so now we'll move to the comments uh, by Professor Eduardo Cofcarolo. Eduardo Cofcarolo is a um, professor of early modern history at the University of Monte in Italia, where he teaches early modern European and global history. Uh, he has been fed of several academic institutions across Europe. He's been a Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer, lecturer at Northwestern University and a visiting professor at Leipzig, um, the UC in Pavia, in the Freiburg Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, he is a member of the Junta Centrale per gli Studi Storici and a chair, of course, the chair, of course, of the uh, scientific committee here at the Fondazione Einaudi. Professor Tortarola has a wide expertise, knowledge, and publications 
volumes on the history of culture, politics, political thought in the age of the Enlightenment, uh, transcultural um, trans connections between Italy and Germany, the history of press and censor censorship in the 18th century, uh, an intellectual biography of Filippo Mazzei, uh, the history of secularization in the age of the Enlightenment, and the history of historiography, uh, covering authors such as Giuseppe Galasso and Franco Ventura. Uh, please, Professor Flores. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, guys, for, for having the patience to listen to me. Uh, I will start uh, by commenting the title, which is quite often a very useful way uh, to approach a book, uh, even if titles are sometimes not really accurate. They don't describe exactly what the content of the book is, but in this case, uh, Southern Europe in the Age of Revolutions, point, the title points to the question of revolution. And I will start by commenting uh, the notion of revolution, the historical interpretation of revolution, since for two centuries European historical culture has regarded political revolutions as momentous events to which great attention and investment in research should be devoted. Crucial. Uh, Issues. And the great narratives of European civilization were built around the assessment of great revolutions. The liberals, and then the socialists, and the communists, they were all convinced that great revolutions were moments of progress. Against the preeminence of revolution, reactionary and counter revolutionary narratives uh, had to admit the existence of revolutions in order to write histories of the desire to return to an earlier, pre-revolutionary, pre-modern, more authentic and pacified um, time. In the last half of the 20th century, the dominance of revolution was expressed in the inflation of the term to be significant. Transformative phenomena had to be revolutionary. And even the church is undergoing an ecclesiastical revolution, which is quite <laughs> self-contradictory, but let's leave it that aside. Revolution appears everywhere as an all-purpose, self-explanatory term. Now we mention a great German historian, Reinhard Kozelek, who pointed out in the early, in, in the 1970s, uh, that uh, the end of the theoretical, but also factual possibility of Bolivian anarchocracies overlaps with the triumph of the unstoppable acceleration of history as a singular collective aiming to be the target. And all this is condensed in the notion of modern revolution. Uh, uh, Kozelek uh, gives us a very general framework, an extremely general framework, that was sketched out, uh, unfortunately, almost more than 40, 50 years ago. So time goes by. But it is still credible and useful, and also explains to explain, on the one hand, why revolution, once a word laden with trauma, tragedy, and bloodshed has morphed into an implicitly positive designation of basically benign transformations in customs, politics, and economics. On the other hand, Kozelek's notion of revolution helps us, helps us understand the dismay of those who write about the revolutionary phenomenon to defend the emancipatory core that was at the heart of the revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the very few books you will not find in the prodigiously rich and accurate bibliography at the conclusion of Mauritius' book is a book by Enzo Traverso, quite popular, which is called appropriately Revolution, published with Petri in, in, in the Italian translation in 2021. Enzo Traverso has made a good effort to say revolution per se is a, is a sort of noteworthy and still to be said uh, concept. And I quote uh, his definition of revolution, an earthquake that human beings experience and embody collectively, that individual personalities can more or less influence and direct, but not create or block. To construct this concept of revolution, Traverso draws on 
uh, two, I mean, quite eminent 20th century thinkers. One is Walter Benjamin, the second one is Lev Trotsky. And Traverso mainly follows the events of the 20th century with an eye that is intended to be told. Traverso, interestingly, also very, very briefly mentions the 1820-1821 revolution in his book. Well, exactly at the other end of the intellectual spectrum, we find Mauritius' book. It is not about political apocalypse or revolutionary regeneration. It is, about the hidden, it is not about the hidden meaning of historical developments or sophisticated revisions of Bolivian politics. It is about what happened in Southern Europe after 1820, followed the Cadiz uprising. And here we encounter one of the major crucial features of this book. According to Maurizio, and nobody can seriously disagree, but to make this point very clear, but to make this point very, very clearly to an unprecedented uh, extent, the age of the revolutions, uh, 1776 <coughs> until 1814, shattered the confidence in traditional powers all over Europe. The, Fear and, and, and uh, uh, shattered confidence were indeed global phenomena. Sources then testify to the variety of reactions to the disruption of absolutism uh, by the French and by the Napoleonic armies. With this was a global trend that Maurizio highlights, and Southern Europe is an element of a much wider plot than the 20th century narrative written by Robert Palmer, for instance, uh, might suggest. I would remind all of you that Robert Palmer wrote a book, a two-volume book, about the, and this is the precise time of the age of, of the democratic revolution, one single uh, revolution. Maurizio's contention, and I very much concur with it, runs against Palmer's in many ways. It is that there was there was not just one revolution, but waves of revolutionary disestablishment of various ancient, ancient regimes. For this reason, there was no liberal constitutional movement, homogeneous and consistent, to be comfortably summarized in a textbook chapter. Rather, challenges to the status quo rulers, sponsored by or opposed to the French and British armies, in most cases to affirm local sovereignty against centralization of power. The common feature was hostility to excessive centralization following the French model. Maurizio depicts in, in detail what happened in Spain, including, and I very much admire him for this, including bibliography in the Basque language. Portugal, that plays a significant role in his book, much more so than it is usually the case, Italy, Greece, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, obviously, uh, as we are all in, in Turin right now, we might dispute the fact that Alessandro and Turin belong to Southern Europe, but I, I will leave that aside and not go into the, the political discussion about that. Attention to details in his book is uh, crucial. An individual lies the smallest units of historical narratives are analyzed in canyons that are both insightful and fascinating. The chapter crossing, title Crossing the Mediterranean shows, for instance, how we should be both interested in exceptional individuals like Sir Richard Church, Emanuele Scordili, and Andrea Mangiarugo, and the contribution they inadvertently made to clarify that, and I quote, in an era of increased violence, forced migration, not military voluntarism represented the most prominent or commonest form of mobility in this ticket. This quotation, one among literally dozens and dozens of interesting and unambiguous statements that Maurizio makes throughout his book, shows the brilliant combination of individual cases and general trends in the, 19, in the 1820s in Mauritius' approach. I would also stress 
the boundless variety of languages that Maurizio masters. Well, French, Spanish, and Portuguese might be unsurprising, but not at all obvious for an Italian scholar. But modern Greek is surprising and worth our admiration. This attitude marks a healthy distance from a model of so-called global history or interconnected or entangled history, variation on the theme are new, uh, quite abundant. Uh, they all share the, the, the feature that they do not engage with original sources in archival research. Maurizio's book is another sort of book. The very accurate description of some of the intricate events in Greece after 1831 would have been impossible without three primary sources and more recent works in Greek than Maurizio is familiar with. It is obviously uh, impossible to discuss all questions raised in, in the book. It is the fate of large and interesting books that are they, they deserve more discussion than they usually get. But I will mention a few questions that Maurizio can elaborate upon in the discussion. The first, as you might easily expect, concerns the notion of revolution. My feeling is that this book is an important contribution to the long overdue revision of revolution in its pre-Marxist Leninist understanding. Maurizio makes use of the notion from the title of the book uh, uh, as it was popularized in the last 10 years or so by uh, Keith Baker that there has been a revolutionary script set by the French Revolution and bequeathed to the following generations. Maurizio mentions repeatedly the, the notion of revolutionary script but in the end, and we might discuss that later, deconstructs it by insisting on the variety of local situations. The true legacy, and I, I hope I'm not over-interpreting what he says, the true legacy of the French Revolution was the collapse of the system that created opportunities for political actors to experiment with different options based on the general and I must, must say, very vague notion of popular sovereignty. Therefore, much attention, more than this is usually the case, is paid to the role of the armies, and my film of, and, and Mirelle Gambo already mentioned that, the pronunciamientos, and to the reality generally associated with the negative moral judgment of civil war, very Kosekelian notion as well. Would the category of revolutionary civil wars be applicable to most phenomena investigated in the book? Question mark. Revolutions were, after all, civil wars. Something, by the way, that is compatible with Kozelek's perspective and with our <coughs> understanding and memory of revolution in the 20th century. But they also made the claim to be transformative to have a political agenda to be finalized. So they were not just civil wars, they were something different, including civil wars. They were indeed, the, the early 19th century revolution, they were transformative when the liberals were successful. However, they, if they were successful and when they were successful, they were successful in many different ways, and again, Maurizio is very keen on highlighting differences, on deconstructing conventional wisdom. One example, how do we reconcile the notion of popular sovereignty with the constitutional reality of indirect voting systems? The exception that Maurizio duly acknowledges was Portugal, the exception to the general rule of indirect uh, voting system. Universal May suffrage, with some restrictions, was adopted at the Constituent Assembly in Lisboa in 1822 with the argument, which is an interesting argument, that direct election would provide the Assembly with more authority to prevent really subversive outbursts and subversive revolutions. So in the case of Portugal, that reverted to the indirect, that reverted to the indirect electoral system 
uh, shortly afterwards in 1826, more democracy was, for the short run at least, intended to stabilize the country. Maurizio is a fascinating player for the variety of situations and agendas. This is evident in the chapter that is especially drawn my attention, the chapter on freedom of the press. The discrepancy between the theory expressed in the constitutional charters about freedom of the press and actual control by the new rulers is evident. And I quote, page 353, some form of censorship was therefore introduced everywhere. No ambiguities everywhere, one form or the other was introduced. The public sphere, whatever, whatever this notion really means, it is, a, as a matter of fact, a, an awkward translation from the German method, which guy. The, the idea that there was something like a sphere, a sort of round object that contains public. I mean, it's not in the original German, it, it doesn't make much sense, but somehow it settled into our minds. The public sphere was conceived as a space to be regulated and controlled. In this case, the metaphor uh, serves its function quite well. Maurizio is right in situating freedom of the press with the continuity in a, uh, of, a long, of a long history that dates back to the inconsistencies of the Enlightenment tradition of freedom of the press, claiming that freedom of the press uh, was a principle, and it is a matter of fact, dealing with it as a very contingent political reality. Free expression, as a matter of fact, did not belong in reality to the nature of rights, those outside history, perennial and unchanging. It was a deeply contingent practice constantly redefined. And we see in 1820, 21, 22, that it was actually constantly redefined. The last, chapters, uh, the, the last chapter, the, uh, it's called, an un, it's a beautiful title, uh, Unfinished Business, right? Yes. Wonderful title. It defines the aftermath of the revolutions in 1820-21 in terms of a revolutionary cycle that ended with the stabilization in the 1870s. Again, the notion of revolutionary cycles overlaps but does not coincide with the experience for many reasons, the devastating experience of civil war in Southern Europe and elsewhere in Europe, of course. The enduring legacy of the revolutions was in fact polarization and instability for quite a long time. The book ends with a comment on the unification of Italy. Italy takes its place in the book, but it's, it's not prominent, to be honest. Uh, I mean, Maurizio, Evidently, loves Spain and, and Portugal and Greece much more than, uh, than Italian history. I can only concur with it, by the way. The book ends with a comment on the unification of Italy and the very slow process of integration of the masses into the electoral system. So it is technical and hermeneutical. The notion of risorgimento is not, if I am correct, mentioned once in the book, and I'm quite a careful reader. He will even <laughs> confirm or not what I'm saying. And definitely, it is not mentioned in the final chapter where, where you would expect it to reappear or pop up in some, some form or the other. This points out that in Italy, the moderate liberals, and I quote Maurizio, the new political elite resolutely refused to broaden political participation, page 604. A very clear-cut statement uh, that defines the, the, the political history of 19th century Italy quite well. Uh, liberalism, revolution, constitutionalism, words matter in the book and matter in, in reality. But up to a point, that would be my comment. Reality, social and political, institutional, intellectual reality is a stronger voice than words, definitely in the history of Southern Europe in the 19th century. And thank you for writing this huge, massively interesting book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And thanks to Leonardo Taro for these very insightful comments. So now, if Maurizio agrees, um, we could open the floor, open the discussion to the, to the attendees here in the audience, uh, so we can uh, um, collect a few more questions, and then Maurizio could reply, roughly reply to both the, the panelists and the members of the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? Only a curiosity. Third, Only one curiosity about the problem of the civil society. I think that is very, very important in your book, uh, the problem of the connection by the military and the secret society. Because it is clear that the research about the 18th century masonry is very, very important, this relationship by the military action. In Piemont, we have uh, um, a lot of research about the problem that uh, a lot of lodge, Masonic lodge, are connected by the army. The, the same uh, king, Vittorio Medio Terzo, who was a Mason connected by the masonry. In general, in any country in Europe, at the end of 18th century, we have a lot of uh, um, army connected by the problem of the lodge. This uh, model of the civil society that is very, very different from the society as a secret, <laughs> completely different, yes. is an organization of the political form, institution, uh, I think that it's very, very important to understand the problem of pronunciamento, the organization of the pronunciamento, and uh, also to uh, what called the um, military culture connected by the problem of constitutionalism. Because in the center of the Masonic Lodge, we have a, a very interesting culture connected by the problem of the constitutionalism. Uh, if uh, I want uh, your reflection about this point. There are other questions that we can collect. Uh, otherwise, Maurizio, you can start with these. Let's see that you could start with a few comments from the panelists and so, um, thank you very much for your comments. You, you've given me a lot of work, which is good, <laughs> to rethink back um, uh, my work and my research. Maybe I should start from the last uh, question, because one of the overarching things that have come up in, in, your, in all of your comments, one, is certainly the relationship between what is happening in, in the, in the post-Napoleonic, post-revolutionary world and, and in the previous centuries. No? There is um, a big problem that I try to address, although in a kind of uneven way. And it is a problem, and now I say this um, uh, in a kind of self-critical, self-reflective way, 19th century historians don't engage enough as we tend to think that whatever happens in the 19th century is all new. Uh, and it often isn't. And uh, to start with the secret societies, um, what I say about the secret society, first of all, tries to move away from the rhetorical approach of the traditional risorgimento uh, historiography that sees them as the hotbed, hotbed of the revolutions and see them as teleologically organized uh, um, structures that lead to the unification of Italy or they lead to the revolution. So I think that there are strong elements of continuity between the post-Napoleonic civil societies and the 18th century world that you have mentioned, uh, but there are also significant differences. Um, I see the secret societies during and after the Napoleonic world as, to use a metaphor, like taxis or buses or trains that some revolutionaries could use 
and jump on them like Uber on and off and use for their political purposes. And in this sense, this is quite new from the previous century. Um, there's no doubt about it. But there are also continuities. There are people in the secret societies also in the 19th century who, who understand them in the same way that the people in the previous century understood them. As space of sociability, of enlightenment, that did not question the authority of the government and that were, in a way, apolitical, um, uh, but uh, part of the public um, debate. Uh, one of the things that I'm quite convinced of, well, it's an argument I do not elaborate in my book, is that there is a deep relationship between the constitutional culture of the 19th century and uh, the culture of the secret society in that lots of people understand what a constitution is in the 1820 in relationship to the structure of the secret societies. So very often a secret society organization is defined as a constitution, as a constitution. And so it was not surprising for me to see that in Naples lots of people had a federalist under understanding of what a constitution is because the Carbonier is, is federalist. Or the Filiki Eteria is a highly centralized organization and the leaders of the Filiki are all centralizers. Just to give you an example. So I think this is a promising, seems to be, field of research to pursue that I want to um, pursue also in the in, in, in future. Um, so civil societies is something new because actors do new things Secret societies is not secret, uniquely, as they were not uniquely secret in the 18th century. They are secret but also public, and places for constitution. So, again, this issue of the, of the continuities between ancien regime or early modern and the 19th century age of revolution that Marx raised, I had no idea that there were this pattern of military protest in the early uh, modern world. I knew that there were, were Patterns of uh, uh, militia mobilization in Spain of, uh, or Portugal, the some attempts that were organized at the local level where there were protests, villages would be organized militarily. Um, um, so, in my understanding, the pronunciamento is something that is rooted in the Napoleonic Wars. These types of military pronunciamentos start in the Napoleonic Wars, but clearly nothing is invented from scratch in history. So I'm glad you raised this, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a thread of uh, analysis that I, that I should pursue. Um, another question of what is new, what is old, that you raised, is petitions. Of course, there are lots of elements of continuities, because petitions were also forms of political pressure, and they were public in, in the 18th century, in the Ottoman world, and associated to public protests. There were public protests and riots in the cities and towns of the Ottoman Empire, very often also organized by Christian communities, not just Islamic or Muslim ones, to put pressure on the Sultan, but also to elect, to appoint new pashas. Okay? So there are also elements of continuity in terms of the issues raised in the petitions in the Age of Revolutions. What is new, it seems to me, very often, is the fact that all claims, all demands, all professional concerns are now re, uh, kind of reformulated in relationship to what a constitution is and should do. People now refer to the constitution to justify their demands. And this is new, and this is very interesting to me, that, they, uh, that the constitution offers an opportunity to rethink um, your political demands. Um, what is also new is that the, a certain deference that existed in the 18th century is now replaced with a more kind of um, um, forceful language that comes from some local communities in relationship to uh, the monarchs. Although in the 18th century already in the Motines, in the Iberian Peninsula, Motines were forceful negotiations and petitions continue to be forceful negotiations in the 1820s. I mean, the whole um, urban revolts of the 1760s and 70s that also Venturi wrote about have, in my view, sorry, yes, and the one in, in Palermo and Sicily have remarkable elements of continuity, well, uh, 
we can find remarkable elements of continuity in what happens in Sicily and Spain with what had happened in that decade. The way in which protest uh, um, uh, plays out, the demands, the way in which the, the populations of Palermo and Madrid engage with the king is exactly the same as 50 years before. So this is important because we also need to think about the age of revolution more in continuity with the 18th century, with the 1770s, not because of the, the it's, it's when the American Revolution broke out, but it's because of the first crisis of the ancien regime that Franco Venturi spoke about that is very often forgotten. It's a remarkably important contribution to our understanding of the age of revolution. That decade is crucial to understand what happens in southern Europe in the 1820s because of the all of um, expedition and, and the revolts uh, in the Christian lands of the Ottoman Empire, but also because of the urban revolts. So continuities, you know. Let's look at what happened before the French Revolution. And this leads to uh, Eduardo's question about what is the relationship between the French Revolution and these events, um, uh, the, the, whether the revolutionary script is new or not. Well, I think these revolutionaries in 1820 must say that what they're doing is anti-Napoleonic and anti-French. It's unthinkable in 1820 to have any chance of success in relationship to the existing diplomatic context, but also if you want to communicate uh, to the populations um, of your countries that are deeply anti-French, that hated the French occupation, if, if you want to publicly defend anything of the legacy of the French Revolution of the Napoleonic world. In that sense, the public sort of communication of the revolutionaries is all anti-French, although with differences. But then if you look at their culture, then there are substantial differences in these countries, and this be a long discussion, obviously. The constitutions of Greece are influenced by the French revolutionary culture, the, the Neapolitan revolutionaries are deeply, deeply affected by the, 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 the sort of French period, the creation of the kingdom under Mura, and they, the, their institutional culture has lots of elements of continuity with this experience. Although their patriotism forced them to move away from, or to criticize also this experience. So there is a complex relationship with the French Revolution because um, if you, if you think there's anything good about it, you cannot talk about it. In particular in Spain and Portugal, but also in Naples, and let alone in, uh, in the Ottoman world. And certainly, uh, this raises the question that, that, uh, that Irene raised of what is new about the relationship between politics and uh, religion in the age of revolution. Is this a, a substantial move away from the Anzen regime model or not? In what way is the relationship between politics and religion renegotiated? Now, I think I found when studying this that it was very difficult to distinguish what was religious and what was political still in, in, the, in, in the 1820s. It was kind of sometimes the political was, was religious and the religious was political. At the same time, of course, the space attributed to, to the political is broadened uh, uh, in unprecedented way, but, but religion does not disappear. It's present in the public sphere. There's no public ceremony, demonstration, uh, event without the public blessing of a priest. This may be superficial, but then uh, uh, if you look, if you study the, the sermons of the clergy in Spain, Portugal, and Naples, and even in Greece, there is a lot of effort put in by the, the clerics to find the roots of constitutional government in the, in the Holy Scriptures. And also in Greece to sacralize the idea of the nation as a God-given uh, uh, um, notion. There are continuities with the 18th century in the Napoleonic period in terms of the attempts by the governments also in the 1820s to use the church as a tool of the government and to actually control the church and turn the church into an, an arm of, 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 of governmental controls over society. There's a generalized belief 
that basically religion is needed to provide the moral foundations of a give any society without which no political uh, regeneration succeeds and no healthy constitutional practice can survive. Of course, this is an argument that anybody would agree with, even the counter-revolutionaries <laughs> in the 19th century, you know. But I think that almost everybody would agree that morality and religion go hand in hand, and without morality, society would collapse. And so you cannot regenerate and, and give grant freedom to any society. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, I was thinking about the transfer of sacrality. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Right. Well. Yes. I think there's more than sacralization of politics. And sacralization is an external, not superficial. You, you talk about martyrs. Okay. Of course, martyrs like Diego, Lord Byron, are lay martyrs. But uh, it's just more than the, the transfer of sacrality. It's that religion is everywhere. Even in the Carboneria, they speak about Christ. I had a discussion in Pisa a few weeks ago with the, one of the foremost uh, historians of the uh, secret societies of Carboneria, Cazzaniga, who told me, well, I disagree with you. I think, you know, there were Republicans in the early 19th century. Uh, the leaders of the Carboneria were not believers. They were free thinkers. I'm sure they were, and of course they couldn't say that. But the success of the Carboneria, the fact that the secret societies could recruit so many people, lay precisely in its public commitment to religion that was reiterated constantly um, in all of their documents. And so, the, the, maybe there is also another element of discontinuity, to go back to Professor Ferroni's question, between the Freemasonry and this world that I, I I've sketched in, in my book. And of course, it's incredibly hard to study women because of the problem of the sources and the documents. And I do agree with you, Mark, that um, studying the private sphere is key to understanding the, the, the sort of the, the politicization of, of women because the private sphere is not apolitical, it's political. It is the place where liberal women in Spain and Portugal use their fans with the portrait of Diego Nito or with the name constitution. It is also the place where the women of the Greek community in Trieste, of the Greek parikia, uh, sewed the dresses for the volunteers uh, uh, under Ixilanti by singing the patriotic songs. Eh? So, and this is a deeply political gesture. You sew the dresses of um, fighters, you do it at home, sometimes you do it in the streets, and while you're doing it, you sing. And women sang at home as well as in the streets. So, and what you mentioned about widow reminded me that the widow of Rafael Riego was instrumental in creating the cult of Riego after his death. And so, there's more than a PhD to be written about the role that widows played in the 19th century in politicizing the memory of revolutions. I don't know if I've answered all of your questions, but I thought that this was a kind of summary of some of the um, issues you raised. And another one, sorry, was the question of the civil war. Are they transformative? Yes, they are deeply transformative because um, they politicize. War politicizes. Civil wars politicizes. And uh, anti, being an anti-revolutionary is a new form of 19th century politicization. And so, because now we need to integrate counter-revolution in our understanding of 19th century as a modern phenomenon, civil war are the place to understand the, you know, the emergence of politics in the context of divided societies. Um, in which the political is deeply intertwined with the military, but also with the violence. The violence of destroying monuments, the, um, the violence of, um, um, of having um, symbolic burials of the Constitution, but the violence of also 
of um, stabbing and murdering in the same parish your fellow parish priest because he's a supporter of the Constitution and you're not. Micro-violence is crucial to understand the nature of this divided society. In studying these revolutions, although it's hard, convince me that civil war needs to be understood at the micro level. What happens in a village, what happens in the street, what happens in a, in a, in a chapter of a cathedral is civil war. I think. <laughs> Thank you all, uh, tremendous. Uh, you can hear us. Uh, well, but it's going to be very short. I mean, when, uh, 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 okay, so I'm more comfortable as I see, as I sit down. Now, I was just wondering if and to what extent you are interested in this specific book, uh, uh, in the sort of, uh, let's say, Atlantic or transatlantic dimension of, uh, uh, of, of these kind of revolutions. Um, uh, obviously, there is a significant amount of work being done on the sort of extra-European and transatlantic uh, uh, dimensions of, um, of, of, of restoration, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and there is a significant amount of work being done on uh, the uh, sort of uh, connection within the, within the Iberian Empire and, and the way in which sort of shock waves. Uh, so uh, across the Atlantic in, in, in both directions. Uh, oh, now, uh, very briefly, like, leaving aside uh, maybe the, the case of Spain, uh, I was mostly interested in in, 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 uh, 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 in hearing something about if and to what extent uh, uh, the, the, the Italians and, and the Greek cases had been to some extent affected by uh, what was going on what was then Spanish America uh, in terms of uh, like a, a, a revolution that was, of course, not a, not a classic revolution, not, not, not a social revolution, but mostly uh, a constitutional one. So um, this, this is something that I would like to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as Eduardo pointed out, out. I take a kind of anti palmarian stance in my book. I want to move away from the North Atlantic. But, but I still look at the Atlantic and uh, I try to offer a global framework for these revolutions by moving away from um, France and the United States to argue, as I do in the introduction, that the Mediterranean and Latin America are a global revolutionary south in this moment. And we need to understand what happens in the Ottoman Empire, as well as in the Kingdom of Two Sicilies in Piedmont and Spain and Portugal in relationship to, to the Ibero-American empires. And in fact, one of the arguments I advance in my introduction is that um, the constitutions in the 1820s um, and the early years, not only in Greece or, or Sicily or Naples, but also in Latin America, are all a response to the crisis of sovereignty of this space that is the result of the Napoleonic Wars. And they are attempts to resolve the territorial crises that are produced by the Napoleonic Wars. And I, found, I think there are striking similarities between the Greek Revolution and what happens in Latin America, for instance, in Rio de la Plata, the kind of collapse of empires, whether it's the Spanish or the Ottoman Empire, have similar dynamics. The, in, you see what happens in Rio de la Plata, where you know, the, um, the revolution results in the declaration of the autonomy of a, sort of a discrete territories, provinces, is what happens in Greece. And the Constitution is a way in which these territories, in the context of war and violence, re-integrate re each other um, to find a new compromise and survive in a context of war and violence. So this is my interpretation. The Constitutions are a tool to resolve 
the territorial crisis that, um, that are the byproduct of the Napoleonic War, in which the relationship between center and periphery, capitals and secondary cities, provinces are upset completely everywhere. Think about the relationship between Lisbon and Brazil. Um, think about, but also within the Mediterranean, think about the relationship between Genoa and Turin. Um, also between Palermo and Naples. Uh, and Catania as well. And so um, the Greek revolutionary and the Neapolitan and Sicilian ones are aware of this context as well. There's a lot of mention of the Latin American space in the Greek press. And the Sicilians, when they discuss whether they should have a federation with the Neapolitans or not, and whether they are a nation or not, and how to rethink the relationship between the two kingdoms, have in mind the Cadiz constitution as an imperial constitution. And they come up with solutions that have striking parallels with what Mexican revolutionaries are discussing roughly in the same years. We should have a single a federal constitution with two parliaments, and the Sicilians talk about Latin America as well in this period. May I add just a very short remark, just to reinforce what, what uh, Maurizio just said about uh, the creativity of political developments in this uh, Atlantic space, uh, Mediterranean Europe, and Latin America, what came to be called Latin America. Portugal was the, the first and, and last ever European country to become a colony of its former colony. When the king moved to Rio de Janeiro, yes. and, and, and Portugal became, in a way, under the control of Brazil. So you, uh, I, I, I very much appreciate the fact that Maurizio is open to these uh, unexpected developments in the political world and combinations that you would not uh, expect from, from this turmoil and, and constant changes. So the, the idea that Portugal is a colony of Brazil for some time is quite, I, I think it is funny. Yes, I open it. And that's why when there is a revolution in Portugal for a constitution, it's a revolution about uh, reclaiming the center of the empire you know, back into Portugal. And there is a declaration of independence of Portugal that is written, which means we want to be independent from Brazil. Basically. So, so that's why this helps me answer your question about what is the Risorgimento. I think that maybe the Risorgimento, as we tend to think about it as the creation of the Italian national state, is the wrong framework to understand what happens in these years, but also in the following years. And if we put back the case of Sicily and Naples into this global framework, actually the fact that uh, Sicily, you know, decade after decade, try to defend uh, its um, existence as an autonomous kingdom becomes more intelligible um, as um, an example of one territory that comes out of the ancient regime uh, that uh, basically is um, <clears throat> well, reclaiming its sovereignty with a new language, which is the language of constitutionalism. And you see that also in, in, um, in Spain, or you see it in Liguria in 1821 and 1848. And um, if you read the police reports written in 1821 that, you know, um, about Genoa, is what's happening in Genoa old and new? It's old and new, and the same can, can apply to Sicily. So there's a strand of constitutional thought in the uh, first half of the 19th century it can only be understood if we look at the history of these countries in the previous centuries and we keep in mind uh, John Eliot's famous definition of the sort of mixed of the um, composite monarchies, uh, seems to me. Another way to rethink the 19th century in relationship to the previous centuries. Other questions from the audience?
Thank you. This has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, the question I have is, is a broad one. Uh, this one. Uh, my question is a broad one, which has to do with the broad question that you introduced at the beginning, your central question, what is the Constitution? And it seems that two broad answers have come up, one more prominently than the other. The first one has to do with limits on government, and that corresponds to the freedoms of the people. Um, the second way of answering the question, which I think could be seen as a Napoleonic legacy, would have to do not with what the government can do to the people, but what it can do for the people. Um, this is Napoleonic in the sense that this is the winning formula of Napoleon. You promote the, the generals and officers who win battles, and then the army wins the war. And it's a Napoleonic legacy that doesn't require you to like France particularly, because once someone adopts this kind of constitution, it becomes necessary to adopt it. So there's a military core to the idea which then can be expanded in a way that someone like CA has certainly did, but to, to get at the idea that the, the whole administration should be based on this principle. And so finally, what you said about uh, secret societies and their constitutions uh, also pushed me in this direction because you know, when you think about the constitution of a secret society, I would imagine the purpose isn't to prevent the officers from oppressing or interfering with the members of the society to keep the, tr the treasurer from oppressing you. It's, um, there's a common goal, a common purpose in the secret society, and um, so the question would be how do you um, find something similar, uh, common goals, a common good for, for the big society, the public, the state, and to what extent this is, uh, possibly completely irrelevant to what you're thinking about. Or it, I mean, it's probably most visibly uh, a legacy that um, you find in, in Prussia and Germany and Hegel and Lawrence von Stein and many, many people after that. So uh, is this clear? This kind of a... Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I... I think I... Yeah. Yes, I'll try to answer. I mean, this constitutional culture of this period is deeply anti-pluralistic, obviously, no? So it's all about the common goal, the common good of the nation. It's all about the fact that parties are factions. Okay, so this is these are revolutions to introduce representative government. Okay, to limit the power of the monarchs. But uh, and of course uh, they take place in highly divided societies in which uh, people, you know hurt each other and stab each other and the uh, radicals ex exaltados hate the moderate moderados in Spain but the political culture is uh, monocratic, it's anti-pluralistic it's about, if you read um, the electoral speeches they're all about we are here today to vote as a community which is also the parish there's no difference between the parish the people, the members of the parish and the voters because voters voted in the church and we have to agree together to vote the best possible um, candidate and there shouldn't be any public canvassing as there is in England, because that's very bad. Okay, so we are all kind of contributing to the same goal of the nation. Huh? And of course this is a, it's a constitutional culture that is not just about limiting powers, but it is about reforming society. Okay? And it's not just because of the Napoleonic period, but it's because of the legacies of the Enlightenment, I think, and also because this is what the Spanish Constitution of Cadiz is all about. Is it, it's also an open document that is aims to reform society. It's a jurisdictional um, text that absorbs the pre-existing ancien regime legislation that is open to constant modification. So there are different, many reasons why it's not just about limitations of power, but it's about intervening to regenerate society for reforms. And one of the reasons why is also in, in these revolutions this is um, justified is because, yes, we, we are amazing, we are regenerated. Europe is astonished that now we are at the forefront of freedom, no? The world is upside down but are also backward communities and societies and so the governments need to turn us into 
citizens, and so the constitutions are going to do that as documents intervening in the life of society, <coughs> not just stepping back. So. So I take advantage, take advantage of my position for a final, very brief question. Yes. Um, in your conclusion, in the final chapter, you talk about the long-term consequences of the 1820 revolution, and our speakers today mentioned several of them. Uh, the role of religion, uh, the army, but also the political instability triggered by these events in the 1820s. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly the fact that one of the consequences of the 1820 revolution is uh, the revival of moderate forms of liberalism. So we are here in Turin, the uh, temple of uh, moderate liberalism in 19th century, 19th century, 19th century. So what's your take? And if you could expand a bit more on this, what's your take on the connections between the events of the 1820s and later ideas of moderate liberalism, not just in Italian Italy, but throughout the Southern European world? So what is moderate liberalism? It's a liberalism uh, that is I mean, there are different types of moralism, as you know better than me, but you know, to simplify, it's a liberalism that um, is based on a kind of new compromise uh, with the monarchs and the fact that you can have representative or, or kind of limited government or representative government with a kind of very limited suffrage. Okay, so controlled by the notables, by the elites, and in some cases it's a liberalism that even rejects the notion of of popular sovereignty, sovereignty of the mind, and so on and so forth. So in my interpretation, modern liberalism, although you find roots of it already in the 1820s, substantially is a European-wide novelty of the 1830s that comes out of, uh, that has different reasons. First of all, it's needed because uh, uh, in front of the re realization that the kings don't want representative government, okay? So you need to, f to find a compromise with them, and the compromise is moderate liberalism. That's one reason why moderatism emerges in the 1830. To move away from the constitutions of the 1820s that are seen as too democratic, too radical, because there is universal suffrage, although indirect. Another reason is because there, if you want to convince the monarchs to have a constitution and some limited government, you need also to reassure them, and also the elites of the countries, Spain, Portugal, Piedmont, Naples, everywhere, that you, you want to keep instability, protest, violence at bay. And crucially, I think, and it's very often neglected in histories of liberalism, this instability not only from the left, but from the right. Because the elites of these countries are terrified by the counter-revolutionary movements, by the masses, you know, ready to cut the throats of the landed elites in the name of absolutism. So moderatism is the product of this set of concerns. Uh, and it's, and in a way, it shows that what happened in the 1820s is no longer feasible. You have to move away. You have to find new ways of impose representative government that is based on different premises. That's my take. I don't know if I'm answering you. It's my take on why moderate emerges later on. Also in France. So we've come to the conclusion of our events. Uh, many thanks again to the Fondazione Inaudi and Fondazione 1563 for hosting this event. Many thanks to Maurizio for accepting our invitation, to the panelists, to Eduardo Tarolo, Irene Gatto, and Mark Field for joining us. Uh, it has been a very rich and enjoyable conversation, and so please join me in thanking again our, our speakers. Thank you.